Yeah. Am I back? Okay. All right. Sure. Great stuff. Thanks, man. All right. So, um, how would I establish that it was an important movement? I think the way to do this, if I want to make these claims that anarchism was globally so important, was so particularly important in the colonial and post-colonial countries, was so particularly important to the left, we need to have various indexes uh, against which this importance can be measured and comp which allows a comparison with other currents. Now, one of them is to look at anarchism and syndicalism, anarchism and its impact on uh, the intellectual world, on the academy. Now, at present, anarchism is not well represented in the academy, in the scientific world. There is some influence in geography. Um, there's a lot of good historical work. But generally speaking, although there is growing work on the history of anarchism and some work on the theories of anarchism, um, it's very, very underrepresented in the academy. There's, there's entire journals dedicated to the study of just tiny Trotskyite groups um, and actually vast amounts of the history of anarchism are unknown. For example, there is no study, as far as I'm aware, in any language that provides an overview of anarchism in Algeria. So that is just one example. Another example is uh, a Chinese anarchist called Chu Cha Pei waged a guerrilla war in Yunnan in China in the 40s and 50s. Um, there's not a single study of, of this guerrilla insurgency. However, this distance between anarchism and the academy and this weakness in the study of anarchism that we have today was not always the case. Uh, many of the major uh, founding figures of anarchism were scientists of, of world prominence. Uh, Peter Kropotkin was world-renowned, arguably, according to writers like um, Dugatkin in The Scientific American. Peter Kropotkin was one of the world's first modern scientific celebrities. Uh, Clues, um, it was another example. Um, anarchism is a shadow of presence in the classic social sciences, critiqued by Karl Marx, engaged by Max Weber, and actually surprisingly an influence on Emil Durkheim. Around the world, anarchism also attracted intellectuals of quite prominent standing. Uh, Isabella de los Reyes in the Philippines, Joao de so Santos Albacini in Mozambique, Ha Dayo in India, Manuel Gonzalez Prada in Peru, Li Pei Khan in China, Salama Musa in Egypt, uh, Shibo Shamalil in Syria, Shin Chai Ho in Korea, and uh, the Vice Chancellor of Beijing or Peking University in 1917, Kao Yun Pai, the Chancellor of Beijing University in 1917, was actually an anarchist. Um, we can give other examples from the European periphery, um, Urban Jabo in Hungary, uh, Mikhail Dramahov in Ukraine, and so forth. So that's one index. Um, Anarchism at one stage was a very powerful influence on the intelligentsia, and it was also an important influence on large sections of the world of art and culture, right? People like uh, Picasso, Pissarro, and uh, Oscar Wilde are ones who spring to mind. Another way to argue for the influence of anarchism is to look at its institutions. I've looked at individuals, and I've spoken about theory, but if we start to look at the organized expressions of the movement, that is, the institutional forms that it took, um, I think there are three main institutions that the anarchists built which allow us to speak of anarchists as a highly influential movement. The first of those is trade unions, the second of those is education institutions, and the third of those is militias or armed forces. Okay. Unions, education institutions, armed forces as parts of the anarchist movement. Now. I have to make a, an argument here first, which is that anarcho-syndicalism as a form of trade unionism expressed, for example, by the CNT of Spain, the Confederación Nacional de Trabajo, or revolutionary syndicalism as expressed by the international workers of the world, I would argue are directly parts of the anarchist tradition. In fact, they are variant of the anarchist tradition. So when I speak here about unions, I am arguing that the anarcho-syndicalist and the revolutionary syndicalist unions were part of the anarchist tradition. And what this really means is we can take anarcho-syndicalist and revolutionary syndicalist unions as a proxy for anarchist influence in the working class. Now, very often in the literature, it is argued that it was only in Spain, or peculiarly in Spain, or above all in Spain, that anarchism was a mass movement. Now, when people make this argument for Spanish exceptionalism, that only in Spain or peculiarly in Spain, anarchism was a mass movement, they're speaking above all of the influence of 
the anarchists in the labor movement, in the trade unions, in particular in the CNT, the Confederation Nationale de Travailleurs. Now, the, the problem is, if we want to use the argument that Spain is exceptional, we can only make that argument if we compare Spain to other North Atlantic countries. If we compare Spain to the United States, yes, it's different. To Canada, yes, it's different. To Britain, yes, it's different. To Germany, yes, even to Italy. However, if we start to compare the CNT and the weight of the CNT of Spain to the weight in other working classes of other anarcho-syndicalist or revolutionary syndicalist union movements, it becomes clear, in fact, that rather than the Spanish union movement being exceptionally powerful as an anarchist force, the Spanish anarchist trade unions were actually smaller. They were actually smaller in relation to the organized working class than many anarcho-syndicalist and revolutionary syndicalist unions that existed elsewhere. What I mean by this is the CNT of Spain, although a massive, uh, a massive uh, part of Spanish uh, labor, only organized roughly half of the Spanish labor movement. The other half of the Spanish labor movement was organized by the Social Democrats through the UGT. By contrast, in countries like Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Cuba, Mexico, Peru, Uruguay, I would also include uh, Portugal, I would include France for a while, the Netherlands, the anarcho-syndicalism or revolutionary syndicalism completely dominated the labor movement for at least a period of five years, in many cases for several decades. So Brazil, in the sense of anarchist influence in the trade unions, in the form of anarcho-syndicalism or revolutionary syndicalism, had a bigger anarchist labor movement than the Spanish anarchist movement, although that is a better known one. Now, when I'm talking about syndicalism, revolutionary syndicalism, anarcho-syndicalism, I want to really stress that these were not orthodox trade unions. These were trade unions that had a revolutionary project. They were trade unions that actively organized in communities, with communities, that were about building a radical counter-public. They were about organizing a counter-hegemonic project, if we want to use that term, among the popular classes. They located themselves at the heart of a project of a revolutionary counterculture, including the production of mass circulation daily and weekly newspapers, including the production of a capacity for education, of, uh, of uh, alliances, of mass mobilization that took them way beyond the scope of orthodox trade unionism. Now, this draws attention to a, a, another key institution which I mentioned which was the educational institutions of the anarchists, the anarcho-syndicalists, and the revolutionary syndicalists. These popular schools, in particular, schools of the people, were, I would argue, probably the second most important historic institution of the anarchist, anarcho-syndicalist, and revolutionary syndicalist movements. I mean, the Spanish anarcho-syndicalist unions were operating a dense network of community centers, schools, and libraries in every village, in every neighborhood, in every barrio of anarchist strength. We can give other examples. Uh, another one would be in Egypt. In Egypt, in 1901, anarchists worked with nationalist intellectuals to found a free people's university in Alexandria and another one in Cairo. In South Africa, the revolutionary syndicalist movement ran numerous classes, education institutions, and even ran a Sunday school, a socialist Sunday school for the children of the, of the militants. Um, yeah, so, as, as I've said, there's been an influence on intellectuals, a second major influence in labor movements, a third major influence through education institutions. Another one I want to mention, and this is an institutional um, imp impact, was the organization of military force. Now, there's a wide literature, particularly from Orthodox Marxism, which argues that anarchism did not deal with the issue of power which argues that anarchism did not give due consideration to the need to defend a revolution, which argues that anarchism ignored the question of the state apparatus entirely. Now, I don't think this is accurate at all. Um, first, anarcho-syndicalist and revolutionary syndicalist unions often organized strikes that had an insurrectionary character, an openly insurrectionary character. Um, a good example would be in Mexico in 1916. We can see similar things in Spain, 1917, 1919 and again 1936, in Portugal in 1918, Argentina in 1919, Italy in 1920. There's a number of examples. So these were not just simply orthodox unions. They were ones which organized struggles which assumed an insurrectionary form. Now, 
during these struggles, before these struggles, and sometimes without these struggles, okay, during these struggles, sometimes before these struggles, and sometimes even outside of such struggles, anarchists, anarchist syndicalists, and revolutionary syndicalists regularly organized militias, which is to say informal armed forces. Um, in the United States in the 1870s and 1880s, anarchists linked to the International Working People's Association organized a number of militias, including the Instruction and Protection Society. In Ireland, anarchists were involved in forming, uh, sin revolutionary syndicalists were involved in forming the Irish Citizens' Army. We can think of Ricardo Perez Mahon in Mexico and the Morganista anarchist militia, early phases of the Mexican Revolution. We can think of the Schwarzschild, that is the black cohort of the German and Polish uh, narco syndicalists in the 1920s. In Korea, the anarchists played a prominent role in the Korean Independence Army. And we can, we can of course, speak here about Spain, and we can speak about Ukraine with Nesta Machno. Now, what I really want to make a point here is, in terms of individuals, we can look at the influence on the world of the intelligentsia, art and culture, institutions, labor movements, uh, popular schools, and militias, we can see a big influence. Now, this brings us to another way that we can assess the global impact of anarchism anarchist syndicalism and revolutionary syndicalism, which is to bring them down to a very specific focus on their role in the colonial and post-colonial world. We can start to move away, and I've tried to do it throughout this presentation, from a focus on Spain, from a focus on France, from a focus on the United States. In many parts of the colonial and post-colonial world, the anarchists played a pioneering role in the trade unions. In China, for example, anarchists founded the first modern trade unions. They had around 40 trade unions in Canton, which is now um, uh, Gongzhou by 1921. Um, the first modern trade unions in the Philippines were set up by people influenced by anarchism. The first trade unions for black Africans in South Africa were set up by revolutionary syndicalists. Now, this brings me to another point, which is that uh, Operating in colonial and post-colonial contexts is very different from operating within the core countries, which is very different from operating in, words, in more Western countries. When we're talking about organizing in a country like Brazil or South Africa or Egypt or Korea, we're talking about facing a series of problems which we could call the national question. Um, we're talking about, on the one hand, working classes that were deeply divided by race, by immigration versus na national workers, by indigenous versus immigrant workers, uh, by workers' divisions between um, ethnic groups, um, language, religion, and so forth. And this is very often the, the, because states were constituted by empire. In many parts of the colonial and post-colonial world, nation states in the classical sense do not exist. Um, South Africa as a country was constituted by the British government in an act of parliament. That is the legal basis of the Republic of South Africa today, an act of parliament in 1909. Now, on the other hand, operating in the colonial and post-colonial world also raised the question of imperialism. The question of imperialism possibly taking the form of a more informal imperialism, an economic imperialism, as in much of Latin America, sometimes taking the form of a much more aggressive but semi uh, formal approach, as in China, with the various um, treaties that were signed, which gave major concessions uh, to European powers, and later the invasion that gave a large part of China to Japan. And finally, we can speak about contexts like South Africa, which were under direct imperial rule. So, on the one hand, in the colonial and post-colonial world, the national question existed in the form of a highly fractured working class and peasantry and popular classes more generally. On the other hand, in these countries, the questions of imperialism, whether informal, semi-formal, or direct, was one that had to be confronted. Now, in the struggles that naturally emerged in these, in these contexts, the anarchists played quite an important role in a number of places in anti-colonial and anti-imperialist struggles. I would say there were three great anarchist revolutions in the 20th century. I would list as three great anarchist revolutions of the 20th century, the Ukraine, uh, the Makhnovist movement of 1917 to 1921. I would list, secondly, the autonomous zone in parts of Korea and Manchuria in the late 1920s, and dated from about 1927, 1928, into the early 1930s, and the Spanish Revolution of 1936 to 1939, which is to say three great anarchist revolutions, one in Ukraine, 
one in Korea slash Manchuria and one in Spain. Of two of those, both Ukraine and Korea, it's simply impossible to understand those revolutions without locating those revolutions within the larger context of independence struggles. That is to say, both the Ukrainian anarchist revolution and the Korean slash Manchurian anarchist revolution were part of struggles for national independence. In the one case, against Russia, Germany, and um, to some extent Poland, um, with Austria involved as well, the struggle of Ukraine for independence, and on the other hand, the struggle of Korea against Japanese imperialism. So I think these are, are, are some of the most prominent cases, but I could also cite, and maybe if time permits, we can talk about the role of anarchists and syndicalists in um, I mean, revolutionary syndicalists and anarchist syndicalists in movements in Egypt, China, Ireland, Malaya, uh, Philippines, Poland, South Africa, Ukraine, Algeria, Bosnia, Bulgaria, Cuba, Georgia, India, Ireland, Macedonia, Mexico, Taiwan. All of these we can talk about, but certainly anarchists were part of the story of independent struggles of the 20th century and the 19th century. That's the point I really want to make. And one of the indexes, the influence, was the important role that played in these struggles and the fact that they turned at least two of those struggles into anarchist, at least partially into anarchist um, revolutions. Now, the anarchists had many divisions on how to approach these struggles. We, we can come back to that later. Time does not permit to get into one of those. Now, if I draw this together, one of the points this means is that historic anarchism examined globally was a global movement, but it was also a movement that we must see as multiracial. It wasn't simply a movement of white Europeans, which is not to say white, white Europeans were not important in it, but it was a movement in which uh, uh, black Africans, South Asians, native or indigenous Americans, Mestizos, a wide range of people, Arabs, um, Bedouin, a wide range of people were prominent. This was a multiracial movement. Our iconography often of focusing on certain great figures, obscures this, this profound international multiracial character of the movement. Secondly, this multiracial, this multinational, multiracial, international character um, existed precisely, existed precisely because the movement did actually address the national question, the question of imperialism, the question of divisions in the working class, precisely because it did not stand outside the struggles, precisely because it dealt with issues besides simply labor struggles, besides simply struggles around capitalism, it was able to engage with a wide range of other issues. And in doing so, was able to build a wider constituency among indigenous peoples, among immigrants, among native workers, um, and so forth. Now, this movement as it existed, I keep speaking about a global movement, but well, what do I mean here? One of the points I want to make is that the anarchist movement existed internationally at two levels. At one level, the anarchist movement existed internationally as a series of informal networks. So at one level, the anarchist movement was a movement which spanned the continents of the world, but did so through links among common press, newspapers, media that circulated worldwide, the movement of individuals through immigration, the movement of notable radicals, diasporic movements, in other words, including political diasporas, were key to the constitution of this international movement. So when I'm talking about anarchism as an international movement, at one level, what made it an international movement and what bound it together historically was that it was constituted in large part by the informal internationalism of networks, the informal internationalism of networks. Okay. Anarchism did not have major internationals for its whole history, formal structures, but it always had these major networks. And with these major networks, we were able to identify a wide range. Uh, for example, Chinese anarchists constituted a network which spanned China, the United States, lots of Cuba, interestingly enough, um, Korea, and Japan. Another movement existed across the Caribbean, in particular centered on Cuba and on Havana. That movement was one which linked up anarchists in Florida in the United States, anarchists in Panama, anarchists in Mexico, anarchists in Puerto Rico, and anarchists in Cuba. The Mediterranean had another network that linked anarchists in North Africa, um, anarchists in Palestine, anarchists in the Ottoman territories more generally, and anarchists in Italy and Egypt. Um, I will talk about the network in Southern Africa later. So at one level, there was the informal internationalism. At another level, 
anarchism made repeated attempts to form an, a formal international association. Now, there were various attempts by anarchists, anarchist syndicalists, and revolutionary syndicalists to constitute a formal international. Um, when the first international split, the anarchists took with them the vast majority of the sections. Um, this is not even a controversial point, perhaps, for those who believe it was Marx's international or those who believe Marx won in the split. Um, this might be news, but generally almost all of the major sections of the first international went with the anarchists. Um, and the anarchist section of the first international lasted the late 1870s, but it collapsed for a range of reasons, economic, social, and political. Now, there was another attempt when the labor, when the socialist international was set up in 18, um, 89, the anarchists were involved in that, or they were later pushed out, but they kept reappearing, as were anarchist syndicalists and revolutionary syndicalists. The anarchists also attempted to set up what became called the Anarchist International, or the Black International, in 1881. Um, the main affiliates of the Black International were actually outside of Europe, the American uh, International Working People's Association and the General Congress of Mexican Workers. Um, finally, the anarchists were also involved in the Communist International. Um, in the early years of the Communist International, the anarchists were, and the anarchist syndicalists were, and the revolutionary syndicalists were an important part of it. Um, some of the main revolutionary movements in the world that initially identified with the Bolshevik Revolution were the anarchists, anarchist syndicalists, and revolutionary syndicalists. And um, there were many efforts to woo them, to win them in. By 1922, for the most part, the anarchists, the anarchist syndicalists, the revolutionary syndicalists had left the Communist International, and many of them subsequently formed the International Working Men's Association of 1922, the Berlin International, if we want to use that term, mainly of syndicalist, uh, anarchist syndicalists and revolutionary syndicalist unions. Um, in 1929, the International Working Men's Association set up the American Continental Workers Association, which linked uh, the, the affiliates of the IWA, the AIT, in Latin America. And in 1927, East Asian anarchists formed a federation called the East Asian Anarchist Federation, which linked the anarchists of China, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Vietnam, and India. So, there were uh, two ways to try to organize internationally. The one was informal, and that was around networks, and the other were formal institutions. But both of those were part of what made the anarchist movement an international one. And this helps us to understand how the ideas in anarchism, including ideas like anarchist syndicalism and revolutionary syndicalism, moved around the world. There were people carrying them, there was a press spreading, there were workers moving around the world, and there were also international congresses, summits, bulletins, which spread those ideas around the world. So I said earlier, that anarchism wasn't simply constituted in saint emir or Geneva or The Hague or London and then spread out. I want to return to this point to say that anarchism was simultaneously and transnationally constituted from the start, from the 1860s. It was a movement that did not diffuse to a passive periphery from the West. It was a movement in which I did flowed in several ways, north to south, south to north. In many cases, it overcame the basic area. I mean, an important point to make here is not only was anarchism internationalist in its thinking, but anarchism was at the same time internationalist in its intent, but it was organizationally internationalist in that it literally existed and operated as an international movement. And what this means is when we talk about the role of anarchism in the colonial and the post-colonial world, we must also be careful not to set up such a thing as non-Western anarchism, or to set up a category of post-colonial anarchism. I'm completely against that idea. The distinction between anarchism in the West and anarchism in the rest of the world is completely artificial, precisely because the labor movements involved in it, precisely because the immigrant workers involved in it, the newspapers involved in it, the campaigns involved in it, the ideas involved in it, the international networks, the formal international organizations involved in it straddled the north-south side. So I'm again drawing a distinction between this. I'm stressing instead that the movements were completely interpenetrated. Um, so it's not useful to draw a distinction between Western and non-Western anarchism or to make arguments that Western anarchism is like this, anarchism and the rest is like this. Um, I'm sure we can draw patterns um, talking about particular regions and regional specificities, but to speak of two anarchisms would be a mistake. As one example, most of the history of Italian anarchism did not play place in Italy. Most of the history of Italian anarchism 
uh, took place in Greece, in Turkey, in, uh, sorry, took place in the Americas, parts of Africa, and parts of Europe. It was involved in Greece, it were, Italians were involved in Egypt, Italians were involved in Brazil. What does this mean? Uh, how, how would we even understand Italian anarchism if we simply differentiated the North and the South? Uh, one of the things to mention is obviously many of these anarchist networks um, drew on ethnicity. If we speak about Italian anarchism as an international movement, the Italianness of that movement is still important. The connection to the connection to language, the connection to a certain set of political experiences is important. When I speak of the Chinese anarchist network that linked anarchists in Malaya, that linked anarchists in Japan, that linked anarchists in Korea, that linked anarchists in China, so. I think we should mix up the medium and the message. Although ideas were sometimes carried within ethnic uh, networks, it doesn't mean the ideas were ethnic. And it doesn't mean those networks were completely isolated. In other words, Italian anarchists were part of a large anarchist movement. Chinese anarchists were part of a large anarchist movement, one which was not internally segregated. Of course, ethnicity and linguistic difference played a role, but people were self-consciously, explicitly cosmopolitans. They were self-consciously, explicitly aiming to organize beyond their immediate uh, national affinities. And in many countries, you can see the contrast, the clash between the anarchists and the nationalists. Uh, against exclusivism on the one hand as promoted by Italian nationalists and internationalism on the other hand as promoted by Italian anarchists who for example organized trade unions in Egypt among um, Egyptian Arabic speaking workers, among Greek workers and among Italian workers. So now a final, uh, we're drawing to the last bit of the paper, but a, a, a f the final point I want to make about the networks is just this, is that anarchist, anarchist and revolutionary syndicalist networks could also overlap with other networks. So not just did the anarchist networks um, blur into each other and uh, overlap with each other, sometimes being ethnic, sometimes being regional, but anarchist networks also interpenetrate other ideologies, other group networks. And one of the consequences of this is that anarchist, anarchist syndicalist and revolutionary syndicalist politics sometimes blurred and merged, melted into, synthesized with other political traditions. I call these syncretic movements. You get a number of movements which are influenced by anarchism or syndicalism, but which are not anarchist, anarchist syndicalist or revolutionary syndicalist in the true sense. A good example is the movement of Emiliano Zapata in Mexico in the 1910s, which was certainly uh, influenced heavily by anarchists, uh, whose constructive program, in particular in Morela State in Mexico, uh, was influenced by anarchists. But uh, I think it's a statement for the 1910s Zapatistas anarchists. They were influenced by, but there was something else. Um, in India, a very important influence of the anarchists was on a movement called the Gada Party. The Gada Party of India was a movement aiming at the violent overthrow of British imperialism. And major figures in the Gada Party, like Lala Har Dayal, were anarchists. And they left a huge imprint on their party, on its ideology, on its practice. But the Gada Party was not simply an anarchist organization. It was one which was, was had strong elements of Indian nationalism, which merged into it. And later, strong elements of Marxism, Leninism, blurring with anarchist and nationalist currents. In Southern Africa, um, a very important figure was a man called Clemens Kadali. He was a Malawian immigrant to South Africa and a major figure in a trade union movement called the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union. The Industrial and Commercial Workers Union set up in South Africa merged, merged ideas of revolutionary syndicalism of the industrial workers of the world type with the ideas of black nationalism particularly the ideas of Marcus Garvey. To some extent, it also drew on ideas of moderate African Christianity. So the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union and its leader, Clemens Kadali, were influenced by revolutionary syndicalism, which is to say by anarchist tradition. But their movement, although it had many of the elements of this, was not quite anarchist. Um, what they would say in a given context would, would depend. The ideas were unstable. They were a mix. 
there were tensions in the discourse that could be manipulated and moved in various ways, and this led also to a strategic incoherence in this movement. All right. So, um, I should just mention as an aside, the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union in South Africa operated as part of a regional network. It spread into three, possibly four neighboring colonies, um, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Namibia, possibly Malawi. So it was also a network of a sort. Now, to bring, it, bring some conclusions together, I want to highlight about five main conclusions. One, conclusion number one. To take the history of anarchism, anarcho-syndicalism, and revolutionary syndicalism seriously is to rethink the history of the revolutionary left. Once we take anarchism, anarcho-syndicalism, and revolutionary syndicalism seriously, um, we need to recognize that the history of the left has to be rewritten. It cannot simply be a history of the social democrats and of the Marxists. The history of the revolutionary left it cannot be rewritten to the history of the Marxists. We have to recognize and find a place in this history of anarchism. We need to rewrite that. Even Eric Hobsbawm, who was an orthodox Marxist, conceded that in many countries before 1917, the Marxist left was on the margins. The main body of Marxists were de facto non-revolutionary. The revolutionary left was anarcho-syndicalist, or at least closer to anarcho-syndicalism than Marxism. Okay, so we have to rethink the history of the left. Secondly, when we think about this global picture that I've drawn of anarchism, anarcho-syndicalism, revolutionary syndicalism, we can start to draw some conclusions that are very significant about the class character of the movement. I said in the beginning that anarchism, that anarchism argued for a class struggle. What I'm going to say now, and I'm drawing this from the various um, uh, material as I presented, is that the actual class composition of the movement historically was primarily a movement of the urban working class. The stereotype, the stereotype is that anarchism was a movement of day class A elements, was a movement of the peasantry, was a movement of artisans. Actually, all the evidence is quite clear that anarchism was fundamentally a movement of wage labor, and it was a movement fundamentally of wage in the cities. The next major constituency in anarchism were farm workers, workers who worked for wages or for kind, but not peasants, farm workers, employed work with hired hands. And the third major class that was involved in the anarchist movement was peasantry, in particular the poor peasantry and the middle peasantry. So anarchism was very much a historic movement of the working class and the peasantry against the stereotype. Now that has implications for how we study anarchism, which I will come to a bit later. The next point I want to make is, the next conclusion I want to draw is, once we understand that anarchism was a global movement, and once we understand that anarchism was a global movement with an enormous impact in the colonial, post-colonial world, we have to reconstruct the canon of anarchism. In other words, if we look at anarchism globally, and we want to look at the canonical figures of anarchism, the key writers that had a huge influence, that cannot be a canon based on a few people in West Europe. It has to be a canon that includes people, for example, from Eastern Europe, such as Pyotr Arshinov, Nesta Mach. It has to be a canon that includes people from Latin America, for example, Praxidis Guerrero or Ricardo Flores Mahon. It has to be a canon that includes people from East Asia, for example, Shin Chai Ho, for example, Lu Sifu. It has to be a canon that includes people from Africa, I would say certainly in Southern Africa, people like Thomas Tibedi, uh, T.W. Tibedi. So we need to reconstitute this. So on the one hand, I'm completely rejecting the idea that the canon of anarchism is people like Max Stirner, Leo Tolstoy, and so forth. Those are not part of the historic anarchist movement. At the core of the historic anarchist movement are people like Mikhail Bakunin and Pyotr Kropotkin. But Pyotr Kropotkin and Mikhail Bakunin are not the only figures in the movement, and if they are central to the canon, the canon of anarchism also has to include major figures in the rest of the world, and that includes people in East Europe, that includes people in Latin America and the Caribbean, that includes people in Africa, and that includes people in Asia. Now, next conclusion. If anarchism can now be defined clearly as a very particular ideology with a very clear political, intellectual, and organizational lineage, 
if we can define anarchism clearly as having a particular political, intellectual, and organizational lineage, it becomes possible to constitute a project of a dialogue between anarchism and the social sciences, which is to say, to create a, a very productive dialogue between anarchism and the academy of the sort that existed a century ago, but which has subsequently withered away. In the 1960s and 1970s in many countries, uh, South Africa, uh, Brazil, uh, Marxist scholarship became an important part of the academy, and it showed that the ideas of Marxism could come into a highly fruitful dialogue with mainstream social sciences. And I think such a project is, is possible for anarchism when we define anarchism clearly. When we understand what anarchism actually is, politically, intellectually, organizationally, I, I think such a dialogue becomes quite easy, actually. I, I think it needs to be done. I don't think it's been done properly, in, at least in English, but um, it becomes possible on the basis of a clear definition. At the same time, I think anarchism, and this will bring me back to the issue of the class composition movement, I think anarchism can also, in its in the study of anarchism, and maybe in the development of a, an anarchist inflected social science uh, um, project, anarchism can also draw on and benefit from particular parts of the existing social sciences. I think on the one hand, there can be a very fruitful dialogue with elements of uh, Marxist and Weberian thought. I think in particular traditions like historical institutionalism, identified with people like Thea Scotchpole, Peter Evans, um, I think that that would be very useful. I think some of the more sophisticated Marxist work, I'm, I'm again referring to those in, in um, English-speaking world, uh, Berman, Lonsdale, uh, as examples, Legasic, um, I think uh, E.P. Thompson, I think a very fruitful dialogue can be had, and anarchism could actually perhaps uh, at least build upon those contributions. Not to say imbibe them, but engage fruitfully. On the other hand, I think there are very particular approaches that are currently extant in social science, which are very useful for the study of anarchism. Not for, an not for using anarchism as a method, but for studying the anarchists. And one I want to stress is the, the new paradigm of global labor history. Now, over the last 10, 15 years, labor history has started to move away from the new labor history of E.P. Thompson, which stressed social processes, history from below, the culture, the politics, the, informality, the for, informal aspects of the working class and the peasants and the poor. And it's also started to move away from the old labor history, which is the institutional histories of unions, of strikes, of leaders, institutional history of parties, of movements movements of dates. And we've moved, I think, increasingly to a global labor history. Now, a global labor history, I would submit, is very useful for studying anarchism, precisely because global labor history's basic premise is that the history of labor and of the popular classes broadly understood has to be studied internationally. It cannot be studied country by country anymore. The problem is the old labor history and the new labor history was based on a methodological nationalism. In other words, it was based on the idea that you study the Brazilian working class, the English working class, the South African working class, the United States working class, the Japanese working class. The problem with that sort of methodological nationalism of the old labor history and the new labor history is many of the most important processes that constitute working classes, many of the most important influences on the working class, classes, many of the most important struggles of working classes don't fit into the nation state. For example, it is impossible to understand the history of the working class in Southern Africa or in North Africa unless you understand that the working class there was part of a set of international labor markets. One example, the majority of age laborers from Algeria worked in France. So the majority of the Algerian work, working class in the 1940s and 1950s was not in Algeria, but were migrant workers in France, guest workers in France. Now, that's the sort of process and complexity that a history of the French working class or the Algerian class doesn't capture. Similarly, many of the things I've spoken about in the history of anarchism, its international structures, its informal internationalism based on migrancy, based on the circulation of a radical press and of radical activists, and its formal internationalism based on the constitution of international bodies, the First International, the Black International, the Socialist International, the International Working Men's Association, the American Continental Association of, of American Continental Workers Association, the East Asian Anarchist Federation. These are, are things which just don't fit into the national framework. 
I mean, similarly, if we look at a lot of what was happening in, say, East Asia in the 1930s, most of the history of Korean anarchism is not taking place in Korea. Korea is a Japanese colony, and most of the Korean resistance is actually taking place from the borderlands of Korea, China, and Manchuria in, through the form of incursions. So I think this is a model which, in relativizing and historicizing the nation state, which, which deals with cross-border processes is very useful for studying anarchism. The last thing I would just like to, to point out there is that if we start to think internationally about anarchism as a movement and think about it as, as a global movement and think about it in terms of the tools of global labor history, which argue that we cannot understand working classes or peasants or slaves for that matter through a national framework, I think we then start to have to also talk about international processes. And I think here, the growing literature, historical globalization is extremely important. In the 1990s, as we all know, there was a lot of stress on globalization, in particular meaning neoliberal globalization. But one of the problems with that literature is there was a, a, an equally important process of globalization in the 1870s and the 1910s. There was an earlier phase of globalization, which coincides very closely with the rise of anarchism. There was then a process from the 1920s into the 1970s of deglobalization and nationalization. And then again from the 70s of re-globalization. And to some extent, I think um, the fortunes of anarchism in, in a way that's not entirely clear yet correlate to these waves and of globalization and deglobalization. There, there's something important there. So to think about anarchism internationally requires the tools of something like global labor history, but it also requires careful attention to what international processes tell us about the forces at work shaping anarchism and anarchist syndicalism and revolutionary syndicalism. Okay, um, I think those those are my main points. Um, I, I hope I've, I've given you a, a number of, of the reasons why we would want to define anarchism more narrowly, why we would want to trace it as a movement that emerged from the 1860s and in, on an international basis and then continued until the present. Um, I think we might want to have another discussion maybe about the strengths and weaknesses of the historic movement. I think it's very important. I, I haven't spoken about strategic differences. That's something we can maybe come back to. But such a discussion is not possible when we have a clear sense of our topic. Okay. So I think there, I, I think I'll draw it to a close. So, Lucian, it was a great uh, debate uh, we have today. Okay. And uh, for, for your cooperation. And unfortunately, we can't talk uh, and make the question because we have some problem, technical problems. Okay. And I need to as well uh, talk with both. And okay. uh, I mean, not was able, I wasn't able to talk with Paul. Or and I need to contact you again. Okay, so uh, we keep in touch. Okay. Thank you. Again. No problems. Thanks very much. See you. Good luck with the remaining Bye. conference. Cheers.